think is that we've gotten to the point where we are so used to having unlimited choice in the marketplace, choice of 50 different kinds of cereal or 12 different movies at the cinema or uh, any kind of hamburger that you want, uh, that we think that we have unlimited choice in morals as well. And so we don't stop to ask, what are we doing with that choice? Uh, the, the point of fact is that when we talk about choice in the context of abortion, choice always means a dead baby. Always. In the context of abortion, that's, that's the only reason people want that choice, is to kill the baby in the womb. And I have no problem calling it a... It is not necessarily the highly emotive uh, picture of the baby sucking its thumb. It may not have developed at that point. Uh, but uh, it is a baby nevertheless, and we'll talk further about that. But in this, in this war, uh, particularly with regard to abortion, it reminds me a lot of the Civil War. Uh, not that I'm old enough to remember that. Uh, but uh, the Civil War was such a, a tragic event in our nation because it was a battle of heart versus mind. Heart versus mind. Anytime you have a problem that involves heart versus mind, it's going to be very difficult to solve. Uh, it was heart in one sense. I think that intuitively you would know it's just wrong to put another human being through the kind of uh, subjugation that you put uh, a slave in. It's just wrong to subjugate another human being. But the mind says, well, uh, economically, we need to have these slaves for our cotton crops. The economy depends upon it. Uh, and uh, you can even convince yourself that we're being benevolent, that they're in a better situation than they would have been in dark Africa. No, come on now. Give me a break. But people did rationalize that way. People did rationalize in terms of what Scripture taught. Well, since Paul regulated slavery, maybe it's okay. So uh, we convince ourselves uh, about things that our hearts feel something about in a different way. And I think that's the way abortion is. I think it's a heart versus mind thing. Uh, I think virtually everyone intuitively just is revulsed by the fact that you would kill whatever you want to call it, baby or fetus or whatever, whatever you want to call it. We're revulsed by the, the fact that someone would kill that in the womb. There's life there. There is life. Whatever else you might call it, it is life in the womb. And so the heart recognizes that, I think. But what happens is that the mind gets convinced that we can disregard what the heart is feeling. And it has much to do with this whole matter of choice that we become so accustomed to it that we're able to do that which is the unthinkable simply because choice as a notion, as a concept, as a value seems to outweigh the notion or value of taking human life. I think uh, just, what was it, three weeks ago I was speaking with a woman who was giving me some insight on this that I had never really thought about. She said, you know, Lagarde, I think really from the perspective of a woman that women in America do understand in their hearts that abortion is wrong, but even Christian women have a mental fear, a mental terror that allows them to permit women having choice with regard to abortion. And those two terrors are this, three actually she named. One, that your teenage daughter will get pregnant and there's an embarrassment factor there that you don't know how to deal with. And because of the embarrassment factor, you say, well, I really don't want it to happen, but I just can't imagine my daughter being put in a situation where she would have the embarrassment, and I think for many parents, men and women, fathers and mothers, parents, they don't want the embarrassment for themselves, particularly if we're in the church. It's kind of interesting that because we're in the church, we have a sensitivity to the embarrassment that would lead us mentally to overcome what in our hearts we know is wrong. A second terror that comes into the minds of women, said my friend, um, was the fear that uh, a woman could be raped and would not want to bear the offspring of someone who had violated her body in that way. I want to talk about that later on in more depth. 
Uh, but that's one of the terrors that makes the mind sometimes rationalize what the heart would not otherwise accept. And then the third thing is something that uh, one of the precious couples yesterday came up afterwards and talked to me about with regard to their uh, newly born baby. Uh, they had gone to um, the doctor, had had the prenatal screening, uh, the test, and they were told 50-50 chance that your child will have brain damage when it's born. <coughs> and uh, counseling, counseling, counseling about that until they got down to the point where it was pretty obvious that the doctor was su suggesting, what's the solution? And of course they overcame it and uh, the child is normal and healthy and thank God for that, but even so, uh, this, this wonderful couple was saying to me, can you imagine someone was telling me to kill my baby? To kill my baby? Because it wouldn't be like every other baby. But I think that there are couples who do fear having to bring into the world a child that's not up to the standards that we normally expect. And that terror grips and says, maybe we need to have a choice there. So the, the heart that recognizes intuitively the value of life in the womb gets overcome by all sorts of mental rationalizations. So it's a heart-mind thing that tears us apart. Uh, so it can be a good thing when we're thinking in terms of we don't want to have a child uh, that is handicapped, born in the world. Good thing in the sense that we have a concern even for the child. It could be rationalized that way. Bad thing from the very beginning, if it's just a matter, well, we just want to maintain choice for the sake of choice, regardless of what is right and wrong. But whether it's a good motive or a bad motive, it's the case. The heart is telling us, I'm sure, what is correct, if we all stopped and thought about it. Okay, so we have a civil war going on over abortion. How are we ever going to solve it? Have you ever stopped to wonder, how in the world are we going to solve it? I mean, the slavery issue took our nation through its greatest throes. Is it not true, I, this has nothing to do with my talk, but is it not true that we lost more people in the Civil War than all of our other wars combined? Is, isn't that correct? That we, Yeah, I think so. It took that kind of a war to resolve that moral issue. And uh, it really hasn't been resolved completely uh, in terms of its actor. At what point in time, have you ever thought where down in the next century or so Will we get to the point where we decide it one way or the other? For good. Get it behind us. Abortion is legal and everybody accepts it as normal, or abortion is not legal and we don't accept, accept it. Or let's say even legal and nobody had one. I'd love that. If we could change the heart and minds of America to the point where who cares what the law is on the books, we've decided we can't do that anymore. That's what I'd like to see, uh, regardless of what the law is. How are we going to resolve this thing? The problem is that we really can't talk about it as a society. There's demonstrations here and demonstrations there, but we're not really talking with each other about it. We're not really opening our hearts very often to talk about it in our minds, to get it together. One of the reasons I think that we, we don't is just right off the bat, it's not politically. Politically liberal part of America cannot open itself up to talk about it because it's, it's on the list of things you can't talk about that's already decided. You just can't talk about it. On the right wing, the religious right, you can't talk about it in one sense because they too have decided uh, that it is it's murder. And so there can be no compromise there. Uh, so it's politically correct to have abortion in the liberal agenda, and it is an uh, unforgivable sin, as it were, almost treated as so by the religious right. So how are we going to ever get it together that way? The second problem that we have is that it's tied in with something that we've already bought off on. It's tied in with women's rights. Um, is there anyone who would say uh, we shouldn't have equal pay for equal work? Uh, I don't think I hear anyone saying that in America today. I still at this point see discrepancies. Women still are not getting paid the same for equal work, but I don't know anyone who hasn't bought off on the theory at least. And I don't know anyone who would publicly dispute that. Certainly no one in the next two weeks who's running for office is going to dispute that. Uh, that would be politically incorrect, politically unwise to do so. So if in fact we have come through a period of time where you and I, all of us, virtually everyone in the nation, 
theoretically believes in women's rights, if you simply say abortion is a matter of women's rights, boom, the argument's over. It's an automatic, it's a given. You see, the issue's dead. If, if you just use your imagination for just a little bit and someone says, well, murdering your husband is a woman's right. Wouldn't that be interesting? Um, there are some who sort of get close to that. The radical feminists who talk in terms of spousal abuse say that there ought to be a legitimate legal defense for the battered wife to kill her husband. Yes, oh yes. Yes, that is definitely in the minds of many today. Uh, and I'm not talking about a sheer self-defense situation where the necessity is of the moment. I'm talking about a situation where a woman is battered and battered and battered and just says, oh, I'm not going to have any more of this, and kills the man. When I was a district attorney in Eastern Oregon, I had a case like that. I had a case like that. And um, it was just as I was leaving office, by the way, and the district attorney who followed me uh, did not take my advice because I said, I don't think you're going to be able to prosecute that. Uh, not because I didn't think she had a right to kill. I, I, I didn't think she had a right to kill. I just didn't think the jury was going to hold her responsible for it. And he tried it, and they found her not guilty. Um, but it's interesting that we take concepts like abortion or the murder of a husband that a woman might not like. If you tie it in with women's rights, somehow all of another, all of a sudden, boom, it becomes legitimate. Um, Abortion will work, whereas killing your husband, as of yet, probably is not going to work across the board. But uh, who knows but what the tie might bring it in closer someday together. Another issue that hits closer to home, and that is this. Have you noticed that I'm a man? Mm, you probably did. Not much of one, maybe, but I'm not a woman. And I'm speaking on the subject of abortion. And that, in the minds of many, many people in our nation, automatically disqualifies me from having anything to say, anything at all, about abortion, unless, unless I happen to agree with the right to choose to have an abortion. And all of those men are welcomed in with open arms. Many of those men, not all of them by any means, but many of those men are men who will never have to worry about it. because they don't happen to choose the other gender to make their associations. The gay lobby just drives me crazy. The gay lobby is tied up with the choice movement, not because either men or women who are gays are gonna have to worry about having pregnancy in their lives, but because they know that the ally in a much larger war is the pro-abortion force. Because if they can get choice for abortion, to kill the unborn in the womb, then you can get choice to be a homosexual. What we want is unlimited choice in morals, whatever the issue. That's why they're allies. But those men are welcomed in. They're in the rainbow coalition of people who will support those kinds of moral decisions or immoral decisions, as the case may be. But for those of us who are those of us who are men, it's a woman's issue, and we have no right to say anything. Well, I tell you, we men in the, in the 1990s have a real problem, and that what our legitimate interest is. We're supposed to be with it men of the 90s. We're supposed to be caring and loving and concerned men, concerned about things like and date rape and child abuse. And any one of us men who is not concerned about those in the 1990s is simply not worthy to be a man in the 90s. And I'm not so sure that part is wrong. But if I, if I believe as a man that we ought to do something about child abuse, I can speak out about it all day long, including any idea that I might have about a woman ingesting drugs or alcohol during pregnancy that causes her baby to be born with some kind of defect. I can talk about that. But if I just happen to believe that abortion is the ultimate child abuse, I can't talk about it. I can't talk about it. A woman has a right to decide on that one. We just can't live with that. We can't just disenfranchise half the population uh, because there are men there. 
And here's the grand irony of it all. Here's the grand irony of it all. When it comes to men versus women on the attitude toward abortion, far more men, particularly young men, are in favor of abortion than are women. The percentage of men in favor of abortion is higher than for women. Those who really believe in abortion, talking apart from choice. And why is that? Men, young men in particular, have a vested interest in abortion. They're the ones who are making the choice for many women to have the abortion. You talk about women wanting choice. Because of young men who get girls pregnant who say you will have an abortion, many young women do not have any choice because the law makes it legal and allows the young man to do something that if it were not legal, the woman couldn't be coddled into doing. It's not just a woman's issue, it's a man's issue. It's not just a man's issue, it's a woman's issue. Life is at stake, it's an issue facing all of us. Well, another reason we can't talk about it is because, frankly, it's too sensitive. I've learned that in my own law classes, I don't dare talk about it without having laid a tremendous amount of foundation before doing so. Why? Because in every one of my classes, I know there are women students who've had abortions. I cannot even go into churches and in groups like this. I suspect that in this group, there is either a woman who's had an abortion, a mother whose daughter's had an abortion, a grandparent whose granddaughter's had an abortion, a wife who's had an abortion, somebody related to us pretty near has had an abortion. And that's why when we talk about it, it's very, very sensitive. And for those who are insensitive in talking about it, I have no room, no time. I hate abortion with all that's within me. I hate it. But for us to deal with it the way it is often dealt with, insensitively, I hate almost as much. It's a sin that needs to be dealt with. It's a critical, crucial issue of morality in our nation that has to be dealt with. But we've got to deal with it sensitively. Now, I may be, among all the men who talk about it, one who can be a little more sensitive than some others. And I'm going to shock some of you greatly by this. But the reason that I can be a little bit more sensitive is that until six months before I wrote When Choice Becomes God, I was neutral on the issue of abortion. And I'll tell you how neutral I was on it. I'm not sure even that I could have even call, our, call myself neutral on it. When I solidified my thinking about this issue, and that was only about two and a half years ago, when I finally came to the conclusion that I'm sharing with you today with some passion, a friend of mine that I had known for some 20 years called me up, and uh, we are one of these uh, low-maintenance friendships that Rubel Shelley talked about at lunch. We don't get together very often, but we've known each other for a long time. And we're close friends. Whenever we get together, we're always close friends, and we catch up and so forth. And she said, uh, well, what's your next book? What are you going to write next? And I said, well, I'm writing a book uh, on uh, uh, abortion. And there was sort of silence on the other line, and she said, what position are you taking on it? I said, I'm taking a pro-life position. More silence on the other end of the line. And she said, don't you remember telling me 20 years ago, and then I heard the words that I had forgotten that I had said to her. She said, I told you that I was pregnant, and I came to you for spiritual advice, and you said, well, let's see now. I guess if a Christian isn't a Christian until he's born again, a person isn't a person until they're born. And on the strength of that very superficial advice, she had had an abortion. I don't know what her boyfriend had told her. I don't know what her parents had told her. I don't know what any other spiritual advisor may have told her. But on the strength of my very superficial analysis 
and very weak understanding, she'd had an abortion. And if that's not enough, it wasn't too much time later that another young woman presented herself to me, very similar circumstances. She'd come to me with the same problem. My spiritual advice to her was the same, and she too had had an abortion. So in an indirect way, there are two aborted babies because of me. Yeah, I can speak more sensitively, I think, than some men can. Say, Lagarde, we've lost, we've lost faith in you. We've lost faith in you. What, what's the deal, Lagarde? I tell you, I don't think that where I was is much different from where a lot of men are particularly. This is where I think there's sort of an inverse woman's issue versus men's issue. When I was first asked about this, I was about 27, 25, 26, 7 years old. At that time, I had just become a law professor at Pepperdine. This was in 1972, and the Roe v. Wade decision came down in 73. So it was right after abortion was made legal. That the and at that time, I'm a law professor, a young law professor. A young law professor has a lot of regard for the U.S. Supreme Court, justices of which I would never have guessed would have led us into the kind of understanding that I think they've led us into. I revered them. I honored them. I thought, surely, if they say it's not a baby, it's not a baby. How could they lead us wrong? The second, and I think maybe more important factor is, there's no one who herself. I mean, I was brought up to believe that we're creating God's image, that life is not to be tampered with, uh, on and on down the line. But as a man, I didn't understand the dynamics of pregnancy. So when I was told what a lot of people are being told, that what's being evacuated from the womb is not a human being at that point, I, I guess I just bought it. I guess I just bought it. I guess I just thought, well, surely a woman would know if it's a baby. And these two young ladies who had come to me just said, well, yeah, you know, until it's born, it's not a person. Because I was a man, I didn't know. I was blind. But now I see. A little late, but I was blind. And praise God, now I see. How did I ever change my thinking? It happened in an evolutionary, gradual kind of process. Except for these two women, and that was something a long time ago that I'd forgotten about, really. I didn't know any women who had had abortions. And then all of a sudden, over the last five years or so, boy, one right after another, abortion, 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 women I knew. Women who were in the church. Women who were preacher's daughters. Young women who were elders' daughters. Having abortions. How did I know about it? They were coming to me once again for spiritual advice, oh, not about whether to have an abortion, but what to do about the after effect of it. They couldn't live with their decision. Post-abortion trauma is the technical language for it, but they couldn't live with their decision. Some of them have done it for the most unselfish of reasons. My dad's a preacher, my dad's an elder. I don't want to bring any shame on him and his ministry. You don't think that compounds the guilt of having an abortion? To hide that secret? And they couldn't live with it. And I think the coup de grace was someone in my own family who I learned had an abortion and could not live with it. Could not live with it. I was picking up the pieces of her life, not quite knowing why her life was in pieces. And then I found out why. And it weighed heavily on me. And I said, listen, Lagarde, Lagarde, if abortion has this kind of spin-off effect, it cannot be morally neutral. It just cannot be. It's not like any other surgical procedure. You don't have this kind of post-operative trauma with any other surgical procedure. 
And so I was really softened up. I was getting my act together slowly by slowly trying to figure this thing out. And then as I shared with those who were here yesterday, a friend of mine out of the blue or at God's direction, providence, I'm willing to say, called me up and said, have you seen Woody Allen's Crimes and Misdemeanors? No. I went to the theater that evening, saw Woody Allen's Crimes and Misdemeanors. Those of you who, are, who were here yesterday know it doesn't have anything to do with abortion, but a man killing his mistress in order to get rid of her because she was getting in the way, and all of the rationale for his killing his mistress was exactly the same rationale that is used in most cases of abortion. And it just, the next morning, the next morning I woke up. This is where most of my books come from, by the way. I just wake up. I've had things distilling in my mind, but they just come to the surface. And the next morning I was lying in bed, and it just, it came to me. Choice has become God, and we're killing babies in the womb. That's exactly what happened. That was my conversion experience with regard to abortion. And it all made sense. And then I started reading a small library of books on both sides of the issue, which is my habit. I don't like to read just the one side. I want to read both sides on any issue I talk about. And I read and I was educated as to what we really are evacuating from the womb. No, it is not necessarily the thumb-sucking, very highly emotive baby, but it is the 10-week-old baby whose feet are the size of my lapel pin exactly, 10 weeks old. If you don't have a lapel pin that's got the precious feet, get them, get them, wear them, remind people. They'll ask you, what is this, hang 10, they ask? No, no, it's kill 10, 10-week-old 10 fetuses. I didn't know the dynamics. I didn't know. I mean, when the mother says, ooh, I feel the movement in there. At, at law, I'd always taught criminal law. When does, it, when does a, a child begin? When does human life begin? They're talking about things like quickened, when the, when the womb, womb was quickened, when the woman felt movement. And what I, what I have learned through my medical research is that, hey, that's just the first time the woman feels it. But it's kind of like there's, there's been a little person in there swimming around in the fluid all along doing the crawl, doing the backstroke, having a good old time. Butterfly, oh, that's a butterfly, isn't it? And then they get larger and larger and larger, and all of a sudden they outgrow the size of the pool. And so they're kicking off on the side of the pool. And that's what the mother feels for the first time. But they've been splashing around in there having a good time for a long time before that. There's life in there. I'll tell you, folks, if wombs had windows, the abortion debate would be over tomorrow. Because when we recognize victims, that's the one time when we get our sanity together and say we can no longer tolerate unlimited choice. Now, what about that womb to the window? That's one of the, the ironies of this whole thing. Do you know how difficult it is these days despite the 1.5 million abortions that keep taking place in America every year, do you know how difficult it is to get doctors to do abortions anymore? The abortions are being performed by fewer and fewer doctors. They're working harder and harder to do it, but they're, they're doing with fewer workforce, smaller workforce, what used to be done by a lot of doctors. The reason for that is medical technology is showing doctors, like it now shows young couples, earlier and earlier and earlier, the baby in the womb. And they know that they just can't keep on doing what they're doing, trashing human life in the womb. And they're refusing to perform the abortions. That's the good news. That's out of Time Magazine. That's not out of uh, the latest Christian Chronicle. That's Time Magazine. I think the other thing that's happening is that we're, we're starting to deal with our schizophrenia these days. It's a, it's a matter of privacy, we say. It's a matter of privacy. That's what us lawyers would drill into your minds. It's, it's all privacy issue, isn't it? Roe v. Wade, it, it's a privacy issue. A woman can do in private. Can she kill her husband in private? No, 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 can't do that. Well, what can she do? Well, again, we use this word privacy as if it's sort of a sacred thing that as long as it's done in private, no one can say anything about it. But we don't allow murder of any kind to be done in private. Uh, that's a real schizophrenia there. Uh, the other thing that we have uh, 
uh, manufactured, and I'm afraid it comes out of Roe v. Wade itself. It's lawyers, it's not the doctors that have gotten in this trouble. And would you have ever suspected otherwise and that lawyers are behind the whatever problem we've got here? Uh, this, this idea of trimesters. Trimesters? It, I mean, it sounds like uh, an academic year, doesn't it? Uh, at Pepperdine, we've got trimesters. Do you have trimesters here? Semesters, yeah. But the trimesters, uh, I mean, just think about how that was ever manufactured, though. I mean, is there any real reality there in dividing the... You know what it related to? It didn't have any concern for the child, necessarily. But it was the mother that we were concerned about. In the first trimester, there's no possible harm or damage to the mother, in most instances, where there's abortion. In the second trimester, it's a little more iffy. The third trimester, there's great potential for harming the mother's life. And so we weren't concerned about the baby, even though that was the subject of the litigation. We're more concerned about the mother and her health. I mean, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be concerned about the mother, but it's just that the baby that was supposedly at the heart and soul of this concern was not the real standard by which that was judged. And then viability, viability. What a sham and a farce the word viability is. I mean, right off the bat, to talk about because the baby is not yet viable, we can kill it. First and foremost, if you kill it, it'll never be viable. I mean, you can just put that, that down. There is not one aborted baby who is viable. And having said that, there's a wonderful commercial out. Have you seen it? There is an aborted baby that is viable. She's walking around. I've heard her talk. She's a lovely person. She's got a wonderful voice. She sings beautifully. She was aborted and lived. To tell about it. To tell about it. I love it. And she's telling about it. Yes, indeed. And they say she wasn't a person. She keeps saying, oh, yeah, I am. Uh, here I am. And she's wonderful. Um, any of you like to go fishing? Bob? The fisherman? Nope. Got, got some fishermen over here. Lee, how long is a fish out of water viable? For a while. But not for weeks and weeks and months and months and years and years, yeah. Yeah, it depends on the fish. Some are, some are better than others, but uh, no. When they come out of the water, they're not meant to be out of the water. That's the point. They are viable within, in the atmosphere and environment that they are supposed to be in. But you take them out of that environment. Listen, if you use this argument, that if you are taking out of, taken out of your environment and you're no longer capable of living... Just think about this for a moment. What if there were some incredible cosmic vacuum cleaner that were to come down onto our globe and to just start sucking people up and casting them out into space? Would we be capable of living out there? No. Does that mean that we don't have any right to live here in our proper environment just because if we were taken out of it, we wouldn't live any longer? I mean, what kind of an argument is that? I mean, the cosmic... Whoever's floating around out there, they have their own little environment to protect them because they're not supposed to be outside of that environment. They're not designed to be. And a little baby in the womb is not designed to come out of the womb. So for us to say we can arbitrarily go into the womb, take the baby out of the womb, naturally it wouldn't live. Well, sure, it might not naturally live. But if we go in there and artificially do it, we know it's not going to live. The other thing that bothers me is this. I know as a former prosecutor the outrage that would have come to the citizens of my county over in Malheur County if we had had someone go into the local hospital in Ontario into the recovery room and take a knife and just slash some newborn baby. Can you imagine the outrage of the community if that were to happen? If we had that same crazed individual go into the delivery room and take a knife and slash that baby just as it came out of the womb. Outrage. Outrage on the part of the community. If somehow or another he had the ability to take some instrument and plunge it into the womb and kill the baby. Outrage. In the ninth month, outrage. Eighth month, outrage. Seventh month, outrage. But all of a sudden, somewhere back down the line, there are two days. Have you ever thought about this? Two days, back-to-back -back days, two days, back-to-back -back days. On one day, if anyone were to kill the baby in the womb, the whole world would be outraged. 
because it's viable. But the single day before, whenever that single day might be, it's non-viable, and that makes it okay for anyone, any mother, to choose to have an abortion and kill that baby. It just doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't make any sense because, although we're reaching the limits now as to where those two days are, back-to-back -back days are, you can't push them back too much further, probably. Just think... It wasn't that long ago that we did have the ability to push it back, push it back, push it back, push it back to where at this point the baby will survive in good condition very early on. Even viability has changed over the last 25 years. How can viability be any guard against taking life? And there's the schizophrenia of it. There's the real medical schizophrenia. Right this very moment in our nation, probably right here in the state, probably right here in this city, there is a building that has the word hospital on it that has two ends of that building. And on one end of that building, probably as we speak right now, there is a team of doctors and nurses racing down the hallway to make heroic efforts to save a premature born child. Heroic efforts to save it. And this morning, on the other end of the same building, in a different room, it's just likely, it is just possible, that we're not talking about the 10-week-old fetus, but a very much advanced fetus may have been killed today as a matter of abortion. More advanced than the baby that right now they're trying to resuscitate in the same building. If a baby is wanted, it's a baby. And we'll do everything in the world to save it. If a baby is not wanted, it's nothing. What kind of schizophrenia can we live with? That is just unbelievable. And that's exactly the state of the case. That's exactly the state of the case. I'll tell you another schizophrenia. One of the young women came up after class yesterday to remind me of this one. Doctor said, don't be thinking it's a baby too early now, just in case, of course, there's a miscarriage. You don't want to think it's a baby. You don't want to be hurt too much by this. What happens in a miscarriage? I don't know many women who have miscarriages who don't think they have lost their baby. They've lost their baby. They haven't lost a little bit of fluid. They haven't lost a conglomeration of cells. They haven't lost all these other descriptions that the abortionists give us. They've lost a baby. If a baby is wanted, it's a baby. If kind of schizophrenic a confession from me. I teach criminal law at Pepperdine University. Is there any other kind? I teach criminal law, homicide. Homicide is the killing of one human being, of one human being by another. In order for us to understand homicide, we've got to understand human being. When does it come into being, and when does it cease to become a human being? And every year, for a low these many years, I've had the case in my case book that talks about the old common law. Murder was of a human being, a human being when it was born. A human being when it was born. Kind of a notion I had all along, wasn't it? Kind of came from law. And then in California, they had a case where, oh, I don't even want to tell you much of the details, but a young woman didn't want her baby uh, when the baby was born. Uh, she put it in a toilet bowl and just left it to die. Whether it had been born or not born, was it born dead? When she had it, we couldn't tell, but it looked like that it was probably born sufficiently in time to have been alive when it was born. And so the court said, so that we don't get into those kind of troubles, let's just say when the baby is born or in the process of being born. Born or in the process of being born. Anyone who kills a baby at that time, guilty of murder. By the way, by the way, 
the young woman in that particular case was guilty of murder because of that definition. The baby was born or in the process of being born. Technically, technically, under Roe v. Wade, because Roe v. Wade only says that states may provide for laws restricting abortion in the third trimester, but don't, they don't mandate, they allow states to have that kind of regulation in the third trimester. Technically, under Roe v. Wade, if a state wanted not to regulate abortion in the third trimester, then a woman could kill the baby up to the very moment, and that would be legal under Roe v. Wade. Under Roe v. Wade, it could be the day, the moment, before the baby was in the process of being born. Now, states do run muster, but under Roe v. Wade, they wouldn't have to. That's the state of our national law. But look at this. Look at this. What happened was that California, one of the nation's most liberal legal jurisdictions, California, we're not talking Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Pennsylvania. We're talking California. The legislature in California said, we don't think that's good enough in the process of being born. And they now say it's murder if any viable fetus is intentionally killed. Any viable fetus is intentionally killed by anyone but the mother and her physician. And so when people say to me, Lagarde, is the baby in the womb, okay, let's, let's call it a baby if you insist, as a person. You want to play the odds on this one? Under a viable fetus, as compared with the entire world, which represents about 5.3 billion people, the odds of the baby in the womb being a person are 5.3 billion to 2, the mother and the doctor. 5.3 billion to 2, because anybody but the mother and the doctor in the entire world, anyone in the entire world but the mother and the doctor, if they kill a viable baby in the womb, it's murder. If we want it to be a baby, it is a baby, and we'll protect it as against the entire world. If we don't want it to be a baby, it's not a baby. What about even pre Didn't have a clue. In California, in a very recent statute, we're not talking a statute that came from the early common law that somehow or another found its uh, 1900s and it just hasn't been taken off the books, in a very recently enacted statute relative to, and, and I, irony here, irony here, probably came about from feminist influence politically in a statute designed to protect women who are pregnant from the assault usually of men. It says that if a, a person, usually a man, assaults a woman knowing her to be pregnant, with that means from the moment of conception. Technically from the moment of conception. If he knows that she is pregnant, assaults her, and the non-viable fetus dies as a result, then the sentence for assaulting the woman is enhanced. Why? Because of the legally protectable interest of the non-viable fetus in her womb. And you tell me that there's no distinction between the woman and the child in her womb? That's the reason she has a right to, to choice to kill it? Because it's part of her body? No, it's a part of her body that if she is pregnant and wants the baby, that will be protected by law as against anybody in the entire world. But for some reason, if she doesn't want the baby, it's not a legally protected person. It's just incredible, the schizophrenia we go through. If we want it to be a baby, it is a baby. If we don't want it to be a baby, somehow it's not a baby. How can we live with that kind of schizophrenia? I just don't think we can. It's just ignorance on our part. We're not stopping to think. I didn't stop to think. We are all pretty much blind. God help us to see. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for uh, putting up with us. And uh, 
tolerating or ignorant. Help us to see the blessing of life in the womb. Forgive us of not speaking out, for not doing more, for not telling the story, for not understanding the story, for not listening to your word ever more closely to see how much you value life. We thank you for the human potential that's within the wombs that are in this room right now that are growing and developing that one day we'll hug and help us to see all of life not just the little baby but the mothers who are hurting who've already taken the life of the one in their womb that they could have loved so much and they know it now Help them know that this is a grievous sin, but a forgivable sin. Help us not be overly condemning of young women who've been, like so many of us, brainwashed on these issues until it was too late. Help us to be accepting of them, to help them. Help us be so accepting of people's mistakes that as a church we're willing to open our arms to women who find themselves pregnant when they shouldn't be. Help them to know they've got a home and a family to go to. And financial support even if they need it. And clothes for the baby and food. Help us not to be hypocritical to say don't kill but then not to support those who make a courageous decision. Help us to think such noble thoughts that, that we understand better and better the beauty of, of life and the value of it, and the sacredness of it. Help us not to cheapen it. And forgive us for having done so so many times, so many ways. We end our prayers just on the cross and saying that we pray in his name. And we know that he didn't cheapen life. The only thing that would save us from our sins is to take another life, his own. And we don't understand that. But we thank you for that sacrifice. In the name of him who did it.